All right. <clears throat> okay. Hi, and welcome back. Um, I'm going to talk about confidence intervals uh, in this video. Um, and everything we've been doing up to now has been eh, of less value. Okay. So today we're going to talk about confidence intervals. And this is really useful stuff. I'll tell you why in a sec. <clears throat> It's really useful because right now this is the beginning of what's called inferential statistics. So what we were doing before, well, it's, it is useful, but uh, when we were talking about the normal distribution, well, we were assuming that we knew the shape of the population. Okay, we those that was one assumption that we got rid of, right? So we first we assumed the population was normally distributed. And that's not a good assumption. Most, many or most populations are not normally distributed. So when we moved on to sampling distribution, we took advantage of the central limit theorem. And we were able to cross this one out. OK, so we're not assuming this anymore. OK. That, we still had another assumption then. This is what we were assuming then. We assume for the rest of the problems we did, usually we assume we know The population mean. We're using that to come up with uh, measures of the sampling distribution, right, to to come up, to draw those pictures. Um, we're going to throw that out the window, and this is where we start adding real value. What we're now going to do is, we're going to assume. Well, we're still going to assume we know the population standard deviation for now, and we will get rid of that soon. So we know the population standard deviation, and then we're going to make guesses about everything else. And this is where it's really useful. We're going to use our sample to make guesses. This is where we start taking observations of the world we see and use them to make guesses, inferences. That's why it's called inferential statistics. We're going to make inferences about the way the world really works. Okay. So, the central limit theorem told us, if you recall, that uh, the standard deviation, that the distribution, I'm sorry, of sample means, of sample of size n, right? So we take n people, say n could be 100, as long as it's large, 100 is usually large enough, that this distribution is going to be like this. The mean of this distribution is the mean value of the characteristic in the population. And the standard deviation of this distribution is the standard deviation of the population divided by the square root of our sample size. Okay. <clears throat> and it's normally distributed. So this is all by the CLT, Central Limit Theorem. It's very useful because we know lots of stuff about, this, about the, the normal distribution. Now, what this means for our purposes today is that whenever we do a problem that looks at this, what we're doing with our our actual estimate of x bar is we're drawing a random value, right? It could be this, it could pull an x bar from here, it could pull an x bar from here. Because what we're really doing is we're not just sampling this, we, we can't look at all of these samples, we're just taking one, right? That's what this is. This is a picture of all the samples, and it's a picture of the means of all the samples. And it turns out that, you know, you draw randomly from here, well, you're going to get a sample that's right here. And this is, I don't know, n people, say 100 people, and it's the mean value for them, right? You can draw another sample, it's over here. And this is a picture of all the bullseyes that we could hit, okay? Now, it's very rare that you're going to get a sample that's all the way down here or all the way up here. It's much more common you're going to get one that's in here because that's what the shape means. The shape is the probability of getting something. Um, and each one of these is related to a value for x bar, right? That's what it maps down there. So we pull these randomly, gives us a value of x bar. Turns out we're going to get a lot that are in the middle, uh, and relatively few that are all the way that are out here, and very, very few that are all the way out in the tails. And that's what this probability distribution tells us. <coughs> now, if we want to, we can we can figure out uh, how far away they would have to be to be out on those tails. In particular, so yeah, let me step back for a second. What we said then is, okay, well, we draw this x bar. We don't actually see this distribution. So this is our best guess for what the true population is, right? 
I put equal question mark because if we only draw one sample and it's this one right here, then our best guess of what the the population mean is 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 is, uh, is our x bar, right? It's a point estimate. You can see that it's wrong, right? Because we you know for now we think we know. You can see that it's wrong. Mu x is actually over here, so we're off. Um, but if we had to, but if all we had was that sample to work from, we would guess that the distribution really looked like this. Okay, we would guess that it was really over here, and so not only would we be off with our point estimate, but we'd be off with the whole distribution. We'd be off on the location, right? <clears throat> Assuming we still know the the standard deviation correct, we know that correctly. We get the shape right, but we'd get the location wrong. Now it's possible that we'll, you know, that we would get say this draw over here, and we think that x bar was over here. And in that case, we would assume, you know, we would use our, our sample and guess that this is what the real population or what the sampling distribution looked like, right? Because we would say, well, this must be the real mean, and so this is what it really is. <coughs> now, very rarely, the probability of getting it exactly right, right the probability that we're going to get one that's right smack dab right here so that we draw this correctly, probability of that happening is is very very small infinitesimal it's almost zero right it's epsilon is the word we use usually but it's very small it's not going to happen now what we might want to know is well given our x bar right we're much more likely to get something that's sort of in here-ish right somewhere in here than we are to get something that's in here right these are very rare we might want to say okay well we're going to draw an x bar pardon me Let's go back up here. We're going to draw an x bar. We're going to, by draw, I mean not, not with a picture. We're going to select an x bar. We're going to take a random sample and find its mean, which means we're going to get a randomly drawn value of x bar. And it's going to be here. Right. Sorry, this should be, this is the distribution of x bar. We pick it and it shows up right here. This is our x bar. Okay. Now, our best guess for the shape of the, uh, of the sampling distribution is going to look like this. It's going to be right around that, where that's the mean. But we know we could be wrong. We know that the, the true distribution might be this. So this is our best guess of the mean. We know that the true distribution might actually be this. right? And we just happen to draw one from the left tail. In which case, this would be the true mean value of x. We also know, well, it could be this. And we happen to draw one from the right tail, in which case this is the true value of x bar, or of, you know, of uh, the mean of x bar, um, and then thus the mean of x. And so what we know then is, you know, we know that this is our best guess, but with some probability, it falls over here or over here. And that's what a confidence interval does. It says, well, this is our best guess, but let's say where we are x percent confident that the mean falls. Now, if, for example, we had a different distribution with a tighter, uh, with a, a tighter distribution, we might be, we might have tighter confidence bars, right? So, let's say that instead of that distribution, right, we had larger sample sizes. If we had larger sample sizes and we drew that same x bar, well, then our distribution might look more like this, right? That's still a normal distribution; it just has a smaller standard deviation. And so now we know we might be wrong. We're probably wrong because you usually are. It's hard to be exact. But now we think, well, it's really unlikely we're going to be out here. More likely, well, maybe this is really where mu x is. Or maybe it's really over here, right? Because maybe the true distribution looks something like this. And we happen to end up in that tail. Or it looks like this. We happen to end up in that tail. Even those are, look really unlikely. But you can see that this area where we think, well, the real mean is in here somewhere, right? It's likely to be in here somewhere. This area is smaller than it was up here because our standard deviation is smaller. And that's what a confidence interval is, essentially. A confidence interval says, okay, so we drew a sample. We take a sample. I'll write this out so you can see it. So we take a sample. We fi find the sample mean. And that sample mean right there, or this, we take a sample. We find the sample mean. And that sample mean right there is our best estimate, right? Called a point estimate of mu x, of the population mean. That's what the sample mean is. x bar is a point estimate of mu x. 
But we can also produce what's called an interval estimate. Produce an interval estimate, which is a range of possible mu x's. And that's what a confidence interval is. And so that's what we produce with, a, with, our, with our estimate. Let's see. Let me see if I can find a good example for you. Uh, let's move this out of the way. I'm going to use this example here. OK. So let's say <coughs> we have a uh, number of miles driven by a renter of a rental car. Right? And we draw, take a sample. And the, uh, of 200 people, and they're all driving rental cars. Okay, so that's what we're looking at here. Let's get our right here, our ink. 200 people, and then within that 200 people, we have uh, 325 uh, is the average. Okay, 200 people. The average number of miles that they drive in their rental car is 325. And this, we are going to assume we know this population standard deviation is 60. Okay. Now, in order to construct an interval estimate, what we're going to notice is well, okay, we know the standard deviation of the <coughs> of the sampling distribution, right? The standard deviation of the sampling distribution, which is sigma x bar, is going to be sigma x over the square root of n. Okay. That's going to be 60 divided by the square root of 200. So that's how many, how big our sample was. Uh, and let's see what that turns into. Okay, so equals 60 divided by square root of 200. It's going to be 4.2427 or 4.2426. Either yeah, 4.2426. Sorry. Okay. Now what we're going to do is we're going to relate, we can draw our sampling distribution that we guess is what we have, right? Let's center around our sample mean, which is 325 x bar. And this is our guess, right? This is what we think our, our, our sample uh, sampling distribution of x bar is. And then this is going to be 4.2426. Now we want to know what these values are that will allow the area in here to be a certain percent, our confidence interval. right? This is going to be our confidence interval. We want this to be 95%, 0 0.95 in here. And that is that is what a confidence interval is. It's these two values, x or mu1, we'll call this mu1 and mu2. And those are the population means that we think would be so outlandish that there's less than a 5% chance that something that crazy could happen. Okay, now this is just like a normal distribution problem at this point, okay? What we did was we created a picture, turned our problem into a picture, and we're trying to find the value of mu1 and mu2. This is x bar. And, okay, so in order to do this, we need to split this in half, which means that we now have an area over here that's equal to 0.95 divided by 2 which is equal to, what's that, four, set 0.475. And so we have 0.475 over here and 0.475 over here. We're trying to find the values of mu1 and mu2 that will give us that. And that's constructing a confidence interval. That's a 95% confidence interval. Okay. Now let's go down to step two. We can compare it to our related to the standard normal curve. Draw one of these up here. Standard normal, if you recall, has a mean of zero. Hold on one sec, I'm just checking my time. And a variance of one, standard deviation of one, and variance of one. All right, it looks like I have about 40 seconds left, so I'm probably not going to be able to get to finish this whole one. Okay, so what we want to do then is we want to relate this to the standard normal curve by drawing these down so that we have Z1 and Z2. They're going to be the same because it's symmetrical, right? It's 0.475 on each side. If you look on the table, it's going to be 1.96. And the way that we construct the confidence interval then is that we take our x bar that we observed. This one's negative. This one's positive. And we relate it to our score function. So z equals x minus mu over sigma. You can use that formula to create x equals uh, 
mu plus z sigma, which in this case mu is our x bar. All right, I'm out of time. I'll do another video to finish explaining this. Thanks, guys.